the Paul Leslie interviews. It is my pleasure to be here in the offices of Bama Boy Productions with the one and only Mr. Milton L. Brown. Thanks so much for taking the time to do an interview with me. It's a great pleasure. I'm glad you're here. We're here in Mobile, Alabama. So my first question, who is Milton L. Brown? Who is Milton L. Brown? Since I know what you're interested in is music and lyrics and composing, Milton Brown is a guy that for 40 some odd years has been traveling down a lot of rocky roads, stumped my toe on lots of rocks, and been very fortunate to have been associated with lots of talented people, and along the way able to be part of some some songs that I'm proud of, and gosh, what do you say uh, that doesn't sound self-serving? A few that may even be called evergreens. Well, where were you born? I was born here in Mobile, Alabama. I think Mobile is a really nice town. I, I've always enjoyed visiting Mobile. What kind of music did you grow up listening to? Not what you're, that, this is not going to be the answer that you expect. My mom raised me listening to classical music and Broadway show tunes. She was a big Broadway buff, and, and when show soundtracks came out, particularly she'd been to New York and seen those shows, she made sure that we got to listen to those. In fact, you'll be interested in this, I've still got some old 78s of Broadway show tunes, and lots of vinyl, lots of 33 and a third vinyls of Broadway hits. So anyway, it was classical music and, and Broadway show tunes. And when I went to college was my first introduction to, well, actually first folk music. And I loved folk music because I thought it was authentic Americana. It was an interesting thing. Actually, that was my introduction to it was in, in college. And that was back during the Jim Crow era in the South, where a lot of the African-American musicians either couldn't or didn't choose to come South. And Eastern Airlines, the old Eastern Electra, I could buy, I think the ticket was something like $89 round trip from Mobile to Chicago. And I could leave on a Friday after work and go to Chicago and go to Rush Street, sit at the feet of people like Odetta and listen to great folk music. And so that was my initial interest. But even before that period, when I was at, at college, somebody introduced me to Bluegrass, Lester Flat and Earl Scruggs, Mac Wiseman, people like I came home with those records and I played them when I got back to my parents' house. I really believe my mom thought somebody had given her the wrong baby to bring home from the hospital. <laughs> and the fact that, that I liked that, but I did. And of course, a lot of that goes back to the old country, or harkens back to the old country. Once again, it was simple music without being simplistic. And I still, to this day, I like it. And I still like Broadway show tunes and classical music. Country, my entrance into country was I was asked to play on a, a local TV show. This is way back before tape. Everything was live. And Don Davis, who ran Harlan Howard's Wilderness Music in Nashville for years, but he was down here then, married at the time to the former Anita Carter, June Carter Cash's sister. And he had a show on television, early morning show on television. And I'd go down there and play live. I'd have like 15 minutes to teach the new song to the band. They weren't complex. Most of them were the folk songs, a country song, maybe four chord progressions. Or, but anyway, I sang there and had Anita Carter singing backup. I was too dumb to realize who I had singing backup for me on those shows. But Don introduced me to some of the Nashville people. In fact, he was instrumental in helping get one of my first serious cuts in Nashville. I had a duet 
with uh, Ernest Tubb and Loretta Lynn on the last album they did. And, and Don, not that song. Actually, it was a different song that he pitched for me to Ernest Tubb that he knew personally called E.T. And that was like a first step. But So it, it's been a circuitous journey. But the fact that I ended up writing country is not a surprise to me because, once again, it was music that I liked and enjoyed. I've written. People know a lot of my my hits have been in country music, but I look back at this and, I mean, I've written for Menudo, for Smokey Robinson. I mean, it hadn't all been country. Can you remember the first time you wrote a song, aside from being a fan of music, when you thought, you know what, I can write a song too? I'd never learned guitar. When I went to the University of Alabama, I had a fraternity brother nicknamed T-Shirt, and Shirt taught me my half a dozen chords on the guitar. So I went down to a pawn shop. I think I paid $10 for the guitar, and it played like a $10 guitar. The strings were so far, far off the frets that it was instant calluses just to try to chord that guitar. But playing that and interested in folk music, I began to toy with that. Really, the first songs that I seriously began to write, I was in the Army in Germany, and I bought a, a guitar in Germany and started playing around there whenever I had off time. But I don't remember a song, a serious song, until I got back to to this country after I got out of the service. And uh, gosh, I may be able to think of the name of that song. I can't right now, but maybe as we talk, it'll mm-hmm. yeah. What when you're writing a song, what is it you're trying to accomplish other than getting the song cut? What is it that you are trying to express? Interesting question. And there's not a single answer to that question. I'll tell you that I've been criticized for writing commercially and to somebody's title. A good example, of course, is Every Which Way But Loose. At a class I taught, in fact, one of the students said to me, don't you feel like you're prostituting yourself to do that? Somebody gives you a title and you write a song around that title. And my response was, look, if I was writing schlock, if I was writing something I'd be embarrassed to put my name on, uh, yeah, you'd be right. You have every right to say, I was prostituting myself. That's not what I do. I feel very fortunate maybe that somebody likes the lyrics I I write enough to call me up and say, look, would you you be interested in taking a shot at this? And a lot of times I've had to compete. There have been other people that they ask the same thing for. And when I sign my name, I feel like it's, it's, it's worthy. And I went on to tell this student, I said, look, there's nothing wrong. If you find that noxious, if you don't like it, you can be a poet. You can sit under your fig tree with your jug of wine and just satisfy you. But if you want to write commercially, you're going to have to satisfy not just yourself, but you're going to have to satisfy the producer, the artist, the label, and ultimately you're going to have to satisfy the public. Well, you've got a lot of people to answer to, and that's commercial writing. I choose to do that. I feel like I'm very fortunate to be asked to, to do that. So that was my response, and that's still the way I feel. I was reading on your website, and all the people out there can visit MiltonLBrown.com. The L is important. Yeah. And there's a picture of, I think it's of the song sheet, perhaps, of Roy Rogers. Oh, yeah. That's exciting to me. Well, it was, I had, oh, no, that was when I was writing for Snuff Garrett, Garrett Music. And Snuff called me up one day, and he said, hey, I've got a title for you. And he did that a lot. And I said, what's the title? He said, Hoppy Jean and Me. And I said, "Mm, okay, (laughs) what does that mean, Snuff? And he said, well, I'm friends with Roy Rogers, and I'm going to, I'd like to take him back in the studio and, and 
have a really good song that spoke of his career and Hoppy Gene and me would be about, of course, Hopalong Cassidy, Gene Autry, and Roy Rogers. Do you think you could do a lyric like that? And I said, wow, he was like a childhood hero of mine. I, you know, I'd be thrilled if I could get a Roy Rogers cut. He said, okay, I'm going to Apple. They called me on a Monday, I think. He said, okay, I'm going to Apple Valley on Wednesday. I need the lyric before that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I did write it, and my writing buddy, Steve Dorff, did the melody for it. Snuff took it to Apple Valley and Roy liked it and Snuff met with people at the label that he wanted to take this project to. And I may not have this exactly right, but I could almost swear that from the time I wrote it, less than a month later, we had a single out on that song and it charted well. I forget how high up the charts had been. But on the strength of that, a little bit later, we did a snuff, and Steve Dorff and I did a song called uh, The Last of the Silver Screen Cowboys with Rex Allen Jr., Rex Allen Sr., and Roy Rogers. And those may not be the top charting songs I've ever done, but they're, my, they're some of my favorites just because of what they were. And when the Roy Rogers, the first one, when the Hoppy Gene and Me record was a hit, I got invited to come out to a party that snuffed through for Roy, and I got to meet Roy Rogers. Better than that, my wife, who is as big a Roy Rogers fan as I am, got to go out with me and meet Roy. So if the record hadn't sold a single copy, it would have still been a thrill. But it did well. Introduced him to a whole new generation of, of fans. To me, that would be kind of, a good thing to say to those people who say, you know, well, you're writing just for commercial cut. Well, you know, that's not entirely true because you are writing for the satisfaction and the art of it. Oh, 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 look, I didn't mean to even imply that everything mm -hmm. I write is to somebody else's idea or title. That, no, a lot of times I'll think of a storyline, a hook in the industry mm -hmm. that, uh, that is a story that I feel like needs to be told. And the genesis of that maybe is the hook. And it may come to fruition quickly, or it may it may summer for, for months. But no, of course you're right. Everything is not sort of predetermined for me. The majority of what I write is ideas that are mine. Could you pick a favorite song that you wrote? Not really. Not any single one. Probably the last of the Silver Screen Cowboys would would rank way up there. Gosh, I don't know. You caught me off guard on that one. I'd have to think about it. Uh, so I've been so fortunate to have such a wide variety of artists record songs that, that I was associated with, and I like so many of them. The ones that really come to mind, though, are the ones that it's more than just me being proud of what I consider good work. It's like getting to meet childhood heroes and be something like both Rex Sr. and Roy are going now. And just that I've got that as an all-time memory makes that one rank way up the list. I wanted to get your opinion on everybody knows, of course, Clint Eastwood as the motion picture star. But as many people know, He's also a musician. Mm -hmm. What is your impression, and given that you do have a connection there with Clint Eastwood, what's your impression of him as a musician? Well, he's a big jazz fan. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, his, that's his love. But when you're dealing with a musician, it's a whole different thing because he looks at things from a musician's perspective that somebody who's not a musician may not. So if you're going to write for Clint, you're going to have to satisfy that ability of his as well. But I will say this about him. He is one of the nicest people I've ever met. And the first time I met him, I had done music for Every Which Way But Loose. And I was in L.A. They were tracking. And I was in the studio. My part was done. The lyrics were done. And I was just being able to sit back and, and watch the full symphony-type orchestra out there sewing away on the title song for the movie. And 
I look up and Clint walked in the studio. I had not met him before. He'd had to approve my song. I think I was something like 14th choice to write that lyric. You know, he had consistently not been pleased with what had been submitted before. Anyway, when he walked in, he had a big bag of, I think they were parched peanuts or something. And he walked over and said, hey, I'm Clint Eastwood, like I, I wouldn't know, you know. And I said, yeah, it's good to meet you. And he said, you want some peanuts? And we sat there on the couch together, just like I'm talking to you right now. And he was as unassuming and as nice a guy as you'd ever want to meet. And he knows what he wants on both sides of the camera. He's a genuinely nice guy. And I find, like, the bigger the people are, usually that's the case. Hmm. I also wanted to touch a bit on Jimmy Buffett. And Jimmy Buffett did a couple of albums that are now collected on this compilation called Before the Beach that was released yeah, right. on Margarita Bill Records. And I think that those albums, in my personal opinion, are underrated. Mm-hmm. I like a lot of those songs. I, I mean, it's not it's not entirely what he's like today as far as... I don't think it's anything like he is today. Yeah, it's very different. Yeah, it's long before Jimmy turned out to be the Caribbean cowboy. Yeah. The sand between the toes, Jimmy that everybody knows and loves. No, when, I don't know how deep you want to go into that relationship, but when I met Jimmy, he was just out of school, and he came into a little studio we had here in Mobile and recorded a few things, and... (laughs) I think back to those days. Today, when you go, even if you're just doing demos, you're lucky, like, if maybe you get three songs in a three-hour session. Back then, because none of us had any money, uh, I'd go up to Nashville, and I could get, like, A-list players that were willing to come in at the worst hours of the day. I mean, when the studio, when nobody wanted to work, we could get the studio much cheaper for, like, maybe the last session that, uh, was a, a six to nine and everybody was cleaned up and out of there by 10. We'd go in and like maybe work from 10 to one and we'd cut 10 songs in a three hour session and do an engineer's mix in that three hours because we had to. Yeah. And, but the difference was back then producers did not expect you to give them a produced song. It was a real demo. Most producers didn't even want that. They didn't need it. And today I find that a lot of people want a record that they, they're going to, basically they're going to make a copy of your demo. Mm-hmm. But back then, most producers wanted to bring their own artistry to the way the song was interpreted. So the demos weren't nearly as full as they are now. And I went up there with Jimmy and he cut three songs on my on my session, and he asked me, see if you can get me a gig up here. I want to move to Nashville. And I pitched it, I'll never forget it, I pitched it to April Blackwood, which was a CBS publishing company. They liked it, the guy running. He said, yeah, but I'm going to have to talk to my boss, and he's in, I think, Copenhagen. But here's the deal, and he laid out the deal for me, which was nickels and dimes compared to anything now. So I called Jimmy. I said, hey, I think I got your deal with CBS. And boy, he was elated. And then the next day, I go back in like the guy had asked me to do. And he said, ah, I can't give him as much as I offered you. I'll just be able to give him half that. And I said, he, he can't live on that. He can't come up here on that kind of draw. Mm-hmm. And so by the time I got back to the old Holiday Inn West End, which was the only motel out on close to Music Row then, my phone was ringing, and it was Buzz Casey and, and Bobby Russell and Buzz. I think at that time had just sold their catalog to Lawrence Well, and he was building a studio out in Hundred Oaks. And he said, "Hey, I heard your deal didn't go down with CBS." That's how Jimmy called it, the Coconut Telegraph. I don't know what you call it in Nashville, but that's how quick it was. And he said, "I'm interested in it." We met at the old Lums Cafe across from Ireland. It doesn't even exist anymore. And we wrote Jimmy's first contract on the back of a napkin. I wish I had that napkin. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that was, we go way back. First song that he had on Barnaby Records was a song called The Christian with a question mark that he and I wrote together. And I think it was on one of those compilations. It's, I think it's so. It's out now, yeah. 
And that was his first release. Three star pick in Billboard. I think maybe it's so whatever he and I bought for our family. <laughs> <laughs> What's on the table right now in the world of Milton L. Brown? Oh gosh. I raise kids. They're they're grown and out on their own and hopefully doing well. So I'm getting more and more back into the, the right brain side of that part of Milton Brown. I've done scripts, movie scripts, actually wrote, produced, or co-produced and directed a film almost a decade ago now. And so I'm doing, I'm really more, getting more and more into that part of the creative muse. I'm back into uh, music writing. In fact, Steve Dorff and I just released a, a brand new CD of songs we want to pitch. And in fact, I'm going to give you one of those before you leave. It came in yesterday. So that'll be going out to A&R people and folks we know in the industry that get back into knocking on doors and saying, hey, take a listen. Yeah, both in film and in music, uh, 40 years after the fact, I'm, uh, I'm back at it and loving every day of it. What is going on in the film end? Are you superstitious? Sometimes. Okay, well, I don't want to say anything that puts the onus, but I've got a, a script that I did a little bit of collaboration on that's being looked at now, and then I've got a script that I wrote in its entirety that if it doesn't get done, i got some folks interested in an adaptation of that. So I don't know whether either of these things will come to fruition, but I learned a long time ago you got to throw a lot of it on the wall for some of it to stick. Hmm. So keep your fingers crossed for me. This is a seemingly simple question, but sometimes it's hard for people to answer. What is it you like about music? Hmm, that is, it, it does seem like a simple question. I think it's an expression of, for me at least, it's like if you're talking about not just what I created, but what I create is like, of course, an expression of my inner self. It's part of me. It's, it's, it's my gift to anybody who might listen and feel either an empathy for or sympathy with the message. But music to me is, is maybe one of the, the good things in life that allow us to appreciate what's going on around us, maybe even helps us keep our sanity in a crazy world. I have one final question. Thanks to the Internet, this interview is being broadcast and people can listen from anywhere in the world. What would you like to say to all the folks who are listening? Thanks for taking the time, and I hope I haven't wasted your time. <laughs> to those of you who maybe have appreciated some of what I've done before, I say thank you. For those of you who haven't heard any of my stuff, thanks to this nice interview that you've just given me, maybe they'll go look some up. And you mentioned the, the website, MiltonLBrown.com. Take a look. Well, thanks so much, Milton. And again, check out miltonlbrown.com. Good, and I thank you so much. We'll do this again. All right, it's a pleasure.